It's lovely to be here. Nice to have an excuse to get a little bit dressed up in lockdown. Um, thanks so much for joining the session and I really hope you find it helpful. So I'm going to open up my notes and we'll get underway. Throughout the session, I'm going to invite Kevin to share some resources with you. Uh, so I hope they're useful. Firstly, my sincere apologies to the IOC for adulterating the language of sport into my presentation tonight. But we are in a race to the finish line with performance exams beginning on the 4th of October, the first day back next term. Sorry, I didn't mean to frighten anyone. This means a maximum of five or six weeks instrumental lessons for some students. So what can we do with this limited time to maximise their performance outcomes? Well, quite a lot. I think the key concepts to keep in mind, both for this presentation and over the next weeks, are the following. Keep the momentum and motivation building to race day. Set achievable and specific weekly goals, which will contribute to the race day peak. Collaboratively build in as much variety across the chosen works and the assessment criteria as you can, so that you and the student are reflecting the broadest range possible as reflected in the prescribed list. And remember that criteria nine from music investigation really says it all. Show skill in performing with musicality through creativity and individuality. I'm just gonna say that again. I lost my spot. Show skill in performing with musicality through creativity and individuality. Perhaps the students should be writing that on their bedroom wall. Tonight, I'm going to address six broad areas to help us guide students to their own PB on performance day. We'll look at maximizing the criteria for both music performance and investigation, enhancing your online teaching, engaging actively in the accompanying process, giving fabulous feedback, amplifying the impact of final lessons and rehearsals, and some last minute opportunities to build excellence. So firstly, to maximizing the VCAR criteria. When looking at the criteria, four key factors are actually being assessed in those 10 or 11 criteria. The program, the musical fundamentals that the student can demonstrate, their artistry and their presentation skills. By now, of course, your program should be finalized. You should be considering the best order of pieces. Start and finish with a bang. Which two pieces does the student enjoy playing most? These should bookend the program. Within the bookends, vary such, such aspects as tempi, keys, tonalities, styles, and degrees of difficulty. Consider pragmatic issues, things like stamina and challenge. Where will you put the tiring pieces in the program? Do you need a lighter piece either side of a tiring piece? With challenge, where will the challenging pieces go? Is it easier to start with a challenge piece or a simpler one? Do student, does this particular student want to get that challenge piece out of the way first? Should we finish with the most technically or emotionally challenging piece, which isn't easy to come back from? Simultaneously, consider artistic questions. Don't put two similar pieces together. Avoid poor key shifts like a diminished fifth. The student mightn't hear the discord, but the examiners might, and we really don't want to put them offside. Where will the unaccompanied work go? As you know, accompanists exit the room for unaccompanied works, and that might actually allow a big style shift or a drink break. Have the student consider how they want the audience to feel at the very start of their program. Is it going to be a wow moment or an ah oh moment or an ooh? How do they want the audience to feel at the end of the last piece? As in all performances, the first and last impacts are what stay with the audience. In this case, the examiners. Next, consider the fundamentals. The fundamentals of playing the piece correctly should have been solved by now, largely. And this is where the tech stack concept is so helpful. 
I now call any problem solving exercise we create for repertoire a tech exercise. And I like that it teaches the students to be independent musicians who can problem solve musical challenges for themselves now and in the future. It's not too late to create or adapt some tech exercises to master those tricky sections, ornaments, low notes, tonal variation, etc. A lot can be achieved with efficient targeted practice between now and October. And so in the race to the finish line, we're left with artistry and presentation from that list of criteria. And these should be our focus from now. Artistry refers to the several assessment criteria which relate to musical interpretation. Presentation has its own criteria and focuses on bringing the music to life visually. I'd now like Kevin to share a document titled VCAR Assessment Criteria, which Ingrid Martin and I put together a couple of years ago for the VCE conference. We, I've tweaked it a little bit for tonight, uh, but I'm going to speak to each of the 11 criteria, focusing on what practical steps you can take now with your students to polish their work. So you'll notice that uh, it's got a bit of a twist. I've put a few little humorous uh, notes there with it, and it is the wrap of both the performance and investigation criteria. So the first three that are listed um, should have largely been dealt with, but there is still some cross-checking and polishing we can do, so I am going to address them. Criteria one, compliance. Follow the rules, duh. Read and reread the assessment criteria, the study design, page 44, and the prescribed list of notated works. It's so easy to slip and make a mistake. Um, to, to have included a song that, or a piece that was on the list last year when you chose the repertoire, but is sadly no longer. It's really easy to make mistakes. You and your student should be reading and rereading just to double check. It's not too late to slip in that unaccompanied piece you forgot or that compulsory Australian work. So do double check. Criteria two, performing accurately and with clarity. Show us what you can do fix what you can't. This includes correct pitches and rhythms played at the required tempi. Hopefully the work is done. I tell my students that all works need to be memorised by the start of semester two. They're often not. This means the accuracy needs to be fixed before that. And for singers, memorising includes not only rests, piano interludes, notes, dynamics and ornaments, but text, emotions and gesture the whole kit and caboodle. But the clarity in which the pitches and rhythms are played can continue to be worked on right up to performance day. Criteria three, performing a range of techniques with control and fluency. Rip it. No, not skateboarding. Although after the Olympics, that's high on my list of things I'd like to do. But rhythm, intonation, pitch, and being in tempo. This criteria is about having mastered the music on the page. If the student still has flaws in their playing, create those tech exercises to overcome the specific issues. And now we move on to what is beyond the page, beyond the notes. Criteria four, producing a range of tonal colours. From Julie Andrews to Aretha Franklin. Students need to show tonal control over the full range of the instrument, as well as tonal color variations within and across pieces. Look at the form and the tonalities to darken or brighten the variations within and across pieces. Use the colors to match the change in structure. Use tone colors to mirror the changing emotive landscape of the piece. Use tone colour changes to highlight form and tell the story you've created, that the students created, in their head for that particular piece. For singers, considering the subtext is as important here as expressing the more obvious text in our tone colours. And I think we need to consider not always sounding beautiful. At the ANAT's voice presentation earlier this year, the high achieving performers from 2020 who performed did not always sing beautifully, but they always sang with stylistic integrity. 
And I'm not saying they had an ugly sound for the whole of a piece, but to make an impact on a particular phrase, sometimes they went into that kind of ugly or harsh or guttural territory um, and that will get you tone colour marks. Not the whole program, though. All right, criteria five, expressive communication through articulation and phrasing. Tell an interesting story that keeps us on our toes. Lift the music to a realm above the written notes. Work with your student to surprise the examiners with, yes, stylistically appropriate, but phrase length changes, ornaments, accents, articulations, additional dynamics to what's on the page, and specific techniques such as growls in a jazz clarinet piece, and a sforzando with added vibrato for a music theatre final note. Criteria six, differentiating musical lines. Whose line is it anyway? Hopefully your selected works reflect different musical textures and the student can articulate where the emphasis should lie in the music. Is there a duet moment between soloist and accompanist that can be enhanced, maybe visually? Is the instrument accompanying the piano in a section rather than vice versa? How can you portray that clearly? Show the examiner that the student understands that. Start working regularly with the accompanist if your student can afford it. If as the teacher you can be present at rehearsals and performances to give feedback on balance and communication between the instruments, that will value add to this criteria. At least have students video performances and watch and listen back for these elements. Criteria seven, differentiating structures and characteristics. Build a suspense. Interpret the shape and structure of the work in sound. Make the varying sections of the form evident in things like dynamics, tone color, as I referred to, stance, facial expression. Instrumentalists, I'm talking to you. It's a given for singers to use facial expression, but instrumentalists need to do it in this scenario as well. Know the dramatic journey of the piece, including say mini climaxes, the main climax, the denouement, and paint that in sound. Criteria eight, presenting an informed interpretation of a range of styles. Don't play Mozart like Shostakovich. Hopefully your program reflects a really broad range of styles. The student should then be listening widely to quality performances of the works to use the elements of music to faithfully interpret the different genres. This should also help them maximize the differences between the soundscape of each piece in their program. Ask them what specific soundscape they're trying to create for each piece or movement. If they can articulate that, then they can think further on it and build it into their interpretative play. Criteria nine, performing musically through creativity and individuality. We don't want Joanna's version of Yo-Yo Ma. We want Joanna's vision of the piece. The broad listening is important here. Examiners will not be impressed with a carbon copy of any famous musician's interpretation of a work. They want to hear a nuanced and individual interpretation evidencing wide listening and thoughtful selection of elements to build a cohesive and fresh interpretation. In short, listen widely and steal the best stuff. Criteria 10, presenting a cohesive program representative of the investigation topic. What's that? In music investigation, ensure the student can fluently articulate as opposed to me, how the pieces chosen demonstrate the topic, and then use different emphases on the elements of music to overtly exemplify the topic through sound. Consider using the option to speak in the performance, to draw the connections, and then demonstrate them through the playing. It's not something I've often done with singers because the singing mechanism and the speaking mechanism feel a little different and sometimes they find it difficult to shift from one to the other, but it's uh, something I'm definitely going to consider in future. Criteria 11, 
presenting a program within appropriate performance conventions. And the Oscar goes to, this is where my drama degree really comes in handy. And if you don't feel confident advising students in presentation skills, most of you have a drama teacher on tap who could attend a performance class and give students some feedback. This criteria is worth 10% of your student's performance mark. So it's worth dividing time to and care. I divide this important criteria into three considerations. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail on this one because I do feel that a lot of music teachers, this is one of the ones they struggle with. And hopefully some of my insights will be really helpful to you. So um, my three considerations. Firstly, what to avoid. Don't talk on stage unless you're introducing your piece. Don't grimace if you make a mistake. Or worse, swear. Practice not grimacing and swearing. Get used to playing on when you make a mistake. Secondly, there's a basic level of considerations. Appropriate dress, shoes and hair. Correct posture for playing and singing. Use of facial expression. Yes, instrumentalists. Use of eye contact with the audience and the accompanist and variation in the use of the stage space. Don't stand on the one spot for your whole program. Can you play in the bow of the grand piano for a more intimate piece and perhaps angle towards your accompanist slightly? Can a singer place one hand on the piano for a stately classical piece, then twirl down stage left into a music theater number? Of course, we can't use a huge amount of physical stage space, but there's still a lot we can do. Can the instrumentalist take one strong step downstage for a dramatic climax in a piece? Can you emote with your eyes, eyebrows and forehead whilst playing the bassoon? Of course you can. Thirdly, the higher level considerations. Namely, how can we manipulate our posture, gesture, eye focus and facial expression to overtly spell out the emotional landscape of a piece. Let me pretend to be a cellist. String players, I do apologise. I might just move back a little bit. I hope you can sort of see enough. So, you know, what is the mood of that section of the piece and how can we physically incorporate our posture into that? Arching back and a slight sway for one section, hunched and intense for another section. Um, I always tell my choirs, if, if you don't use expression, physical expression, the audience might as well be listening to a CD. We don't want to visually bore our examiners. Can a playful piece include a sense of performing to a broad audience and the student use eye contact to different parts of the audience at different moments? Can an intimate piece commence with the head and eyes dropped and float up slowly on the piano introduction? Can an electric guitarist find the moments which aren't too technically taxing to interact with the mosh pit or go down on a theatrical knee? Can the dramatic climax of a piece be played with face and eyes lifted out to the horizon line above the examiner's heads where actors look in soliloquy? Can a flautist flourish their instrument and head at the end of a dramatic climactic long note rather than just stopping dead? At Coral, where, where I work, I'm now attending the weekly VCE performance classes to give students such specific feedback on criteria 10 to value add to their performance and hopefully their result. I'd be happy to run a masterclass at your school if that would be helpful and if I'm allowed. <laughs> We're in the performing game and the visual is important, not just the oral in telling the whole story of a piece of music. Phew, we made it through the 11 criteria. Now let's get back to the broad discussion topics. Topic number two, enhancing your online teaching. We all wish we weren't here, 
But online teaching is not all bad leading up to performances. I'm sure you've all found creative uses of this medium to help your students. Here are some that I've used. Given that we don't know how much face-to-face -face time we have left, we need to be thinking laterally about how best to use the medium moving forward. Excuse me a minute. Online lessons certainly focus me on the visual elements of my students singing. Watch your students play and give them feedback about posture, fingering, hand positions, jaw length, embouchure, vowel shapes, etc. You'll also see any bad habits of gesture or facial expression, such as fidgeting, sweaty hand wiping, my pet hate, hair flicking, mistake grimaces, frowning, and so on. Pressing record for a performance run online gives them the opportunity to watch back, reflect, and improve both on visual and oral elements of their performance. Take the time to discuss how they consider performing the piece. With physically aware students, seek their ideas first. And with less aware students, perhaps demonstrate body shapes, angles, gesture, etc. that they might like to consider. Screen share great performances they could get ideas from or have them do the same for you. We can stage and choreograph almost as effectively online as in person. And now is the time to do it because students need time to own the staging and make it an organic part of their performance, not an added on extra, which will look fake and worse could distract them in the performance. Linking use of stage space, body movement, gesture and facial expression to the emotional shape of the piece is key to it being honest and organic. As I alluded to before, the student must know the story of each piece and my students actually write their emotions on the score per phrase and this tells them how to sing the piece. It gives them the dynamics, the articulations, the tone colours and the end product is then an organic and unique performance which should move the audience. The online setting allows me to not play accompaniments and devote my whole focus to the students' work so I can immediately address technical and expressive issues. It also shows what bits they don't know in their pieces without the piano supporting them. I'm now typing, luckily by touch, in the chat as I watch and listen to each piece in lessons. Longer pieces I do by section, then we discuss my findings and work back over specific sections to fix issues and as needed, create tech exercises the student can work on for the week. The students then cut and paste the whole chat so that they have all the notes as reference material for practice. What about when things go wrong online? What if the student's microphone doesn't work? This actually happened to Ingrid Martin recently and we were chatting about it. Being brilliant, Ingrid turned it into a positive. She had the student write in the chat what the character of the piece was or the story, they then mimed out that story without playing in a really exaggerated way while still holding their instrument. To really experience how far they could take their physical expression, the student and the teacher then reflected on that and then they repeated the exercise but this time playing. Then again, they reassessed the benefits and, and even some of the, the problems. Um, you know, there were some movements that were too exaggerated to, to and they negatively affected the sound. Such activities show us how the physical can really add to expressive playing, but the going too far can hinder our playing. When choreographing my son's music investigation performance a couple of years ago, he said, Mum, I just have to watch my fingers in this section because it's really hard to play. Lesson learned. My singers, for example, always stand still in the hardest moments to concentrate on their technique. I hope there's no singing examiners watching. <laughs> the camera is the student's friend. In online lessons, have students play and watch themselves in the camera, then articulate what they saw, or have them record themselves out of the lesson and watch it back to assess their observations with them. You can use the visual medium to ask a series of questions, and I thank Ingrid for these, as they're really appropriate, especially for instrumentalists. 
what's the character of the section? The reason it's appropriate for instrumentalists is because you don't have text as such a clear guide to what singers should be expressing. What's the character of the section? Physicalize that. Now play the first phrases of that section in that physicality. How does that look and feel different to what you did before? So ask really clear, precise questions of them as you do these processes. Ask questions like, what did you hear? What did you see? How did you feel? And ask them to reflect on what did the audience hear, see, and feel? Should these two align? Can they align? What does the audience need to hear, see, and feel? Fantastic questions that I'm definitely taking back to my students. Singers, of course, have text to help them plot their emotional journey, but they also need to explore how to make that visual. And I always ask them to look vertically at what the accompaniment is saying about the emotional landscape and also the musical landscape. Often in vocal music, uh, dynamics are written in the piano part and not in the vocal part. So we do need to look vertically. And also with singers, can a subtext contrasting the text be expressed at times when it's evident in the accompaniment? I always thank Mr Sondheim at a moment like this, whose subtexts are deep and rich. Okay, number three, enough of online. Engaging actively in the accompanying process. And this is specifically aimed at teachers. In a recent seminar, I called accompanists angels from the realms of glory. Value and support your angels. Teach students to book them early. Treat them professionally. And how do we express their musical vision to them? Students don't just magically know how to work with an accompanist, let alone lead one if we don't model and scaffold that learning for them. Explicitly teach them to make eye contact, how to work as a team, to breathe in tempo and style, to listen. Engage the best accompanist the student can afford, book them early, be very nice to them, match the accompanist's personality to the student. I think this is our job as the instrumental teacher to fully engage in this important process. For me, it's a very hands-on process, not a hands-off one. Furthermore, I think we should be sitting in on their rehearsals, guiding them both to create a shared vision of the interpretation of the pieces. I always attend at least the first rehearsal, and usually several, to support and assist this important step in the process. Also consider attending performance classes, performance assessments, holiday final rehearsals, and practice exams. It's obviously easier if you're in attendance at the school. If you're teaching externally, then obviously you need to seek permission and you need to liaise with the classroom teacher, but it's really worth it for your student. Um, in those sorts of situations, I'll sit with the classroom teacher behind the desk and any other invited assessors, and I write my own critiques on each piece. Then I hand this to the student for their attention. I know that my students really appreciate this extra level of support I give them by simply being there and showing that I care. I think the feedback is probably just a bonus. Best practice feedback. Number four, start with a positive. Write neatly, not like what you're about to see from me. Be constructive, be specific. Building the solution to the problem. Be timely. Keep a copy and address the issues directly in the next lesson. Praise the student's success in overcoming the issues. Now, I'd like Kevin to share an example from a current student from their recent assessment soiree rehearsal. Thanks, Kevin. I'm going to refer to a hard copy. So, very messy writing, oops, but by now after five years she can read my writing. Kevin, is that sharing? Let me 
me just jump back to the Zoom page. Yes, it is fantastic. Okay, so as you'll see, um, in June, this was the rehearsal before the assessment soiree. She was doing Redente La Calma. We ran it twice um, and I took notes each time. So uh, the point of the rehearsal was really for her to get comfortable with the accompanist. But as you'll see from these notes, a lot of the notes were about her actual singing. Um, if you just scroll down, Kevin, thanks to the second page, we ran Chanson d'Amour three times. Uh, this was the first time, or oh, probably the second time that the student had worked with the accompanist on this repertoire, but not these specific pieces. So they had never run this piece together because we're at a public school. Um, and sadly, we don't have a competence on tap and I'm shocking. Uh, but we ran this piece three times because of the complexity of the accompaniment. But I was always able to find um, elements to refer to. And Kevin, if you just scroll down to when I look at you and I couldn't be happier, I just wanted to bring out a few points here of the sorts of specific feedback I give the student. So started with a big tick because it was really a fabulous performance. Um, suggested that she film herself. She was smiling in some of the memory sections which were meant to be more happy um, and she was frowning. So I just wanted to mention that to her. Um, poor placement of breath, but I gave her the specific uh, phrase. Good correct pictures and again on a specific section. Emotions excellent underlined. No exclamation, I should have done that. Uh, a specific section now remembering where the rhythm, I wasn't sure, I didn't have the score in front of me, was the rhythm correct, was it not? Um, changing up tone, there's a great word bitter in the song, which is a beautiful opportunity to add a bitter feeling and tone colour um, and change it up. And then I couldn't be happier. I found a moment where she could actually communicate directly with the accompanist in this song um, and make it more of a, a team song rather than straight out to the audience. Uh, well, not simply as a kind of wry comment that the character makes. Why not make that to the accompanist? Uh, the second set of couldn't be's we had talked about terrace dynamics. And so she was meant to lift the terrace dynamics up through that section. A couple of other points, bridges you cross, I didn't catch the diction, so I've asked for more clarity there. And true, I wanted a laser beam tonal quality on that word, and she knows exactly what that means when I write laser beam. <laughs> so there's an idea of the sort of notes I give my students when I watch them in the performance context throughout the year. And they always get, get a copy and I keep a copy and we go from there. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, we're going to move on to point number five, amplifying the impact of those final lessons and rehearsals. Just a few dot points here. Be efficient and organised. This is not the time to, apart from a quick, how are you feeling? How are you coping with COVID? You've got to get onto the work. I'm now ticking off each piece uh, in a special book that I have so that over the two lessons, I know we've covered the entire repertoire, every two lessons. We're experimenting with program order for flow, impact and technical ease. We're staging the program from the first second the student enters the space until the second they leave. I actually choreograph the whole thing and it gives them such comfort to know exactly what they have to do at each moment and to be able to sort of work that in so that it looks natural and fluid. We're addressing performance nerves and exercises to manage these. We'll be asking permission, COVID willing, to rehearse in the exam space so the student can visualise themselves in the space when they're practising at home or at school, engage the acoustic, the balance with the piano, the relative projection requirements, etc. If we can't access the space with the student, 
I'll ask for photos and discuss the acoustics as, as I know those spaces. Um, but it's much better if they can do that themselves live. We'll be performing and playing anyway in different acoustics and for different audiences around the school to be better able to adjust to the exam space and conditions on race day. We're discussing the practical considerations for the exam day and we're definitely visualising success. Kevin's now going to share a handy tool of checklists you might like to consider. Uh, so Ingrid and I drew these up for the VCE conference and, and I was looking over them and thinking, yeah, this is actually very, very practical. And I've certainly been using it with my students um, in the last couple of years. So I won't talk on and on about it, but some of the checklists, what to do before the day, the things you need to collate, an on-the-day checklist before you leave home, having the student work out the warm-up they're going to do at home in the morning before they go to their exam, what are the steps they're going to go through at the venue outside the room in their warm-up room, what instrument preparation do they need to make when they're in the venue? What mental preparation are they going to do? And once they're inside the room, where are they going to put their running sheet? Are they going to have a physical running sheet or is it all ingrained so they don't need it? How are they going to enter the space? Greet the examiners. Hand their forms to the examiners. This all needs to be practised. Um, I, love, I love that the word for rehearsals in French is um, répétition. How are they going to set up? What steps are they going to go through in order? And for students using electronic instruments, this is incredibly important. How are they going to tune? When the exam itself begins, once the candidate number is read, how are they going to indicate that they're ready to their accompanist? And then for each of the pieces that they're going to perform, they should have decided some trigger words or images for the piece. Um, how are they going to begin? What are the little performance moments throughout the piece or the key things they want to think about? How are they going to hold the silence at the end of the piece? How are they going to smile? How are they going to transition from the piece to the next piece? Um, are they going to bow? Are they going to save a bow to the end of the program, et cetera, et cetera? So if you can plot that out with your students, they're going to feel incredibly comfortable and prepared when they walk into that room. Thanks very much, Kevin. Okay, final point and then questions. Opportunities to build excellence. Now, we know there's no such thing as, perf as perfection, but we can certainly aim to be excellent as an individual. What is the individual's excellence? As we reach the stadium in the marathon that is VCE Music, I aim for my students to peak early. I want them to be a performance standard at least two weeks before their exam date, usually by the end of this term. This way, they can be confident they'll do a good job and will not waste important and limited energy on worrying about whether they can play the piece, reach the high note, execute the run, etc. This peaking early also means we have valuable time to polish each piece to the highest standard. Is the student expressing the story of the piece not only through their playing, but also their physicality and facial expression? Are they using the full resources of the elements of music to express what the music means to them? Are they playing each genre stylistically appropriately and clearly demonstrating their fluency and musicality? Can they engage with an imaginary audience, even in an exam, and treat it as a performance, not just a test? And lastly, I remind them that what they've learned in VCE about being a musician and a performer is far more important. I'm gonna change that. A musician, a performer, and a person is far more important than a mark out of 50. We want our students to develop a growth mindset, 
realistically and kindly assess their own competence, build their library of successes, plan for their own future growth, overwrite negative self-talk, and constantly reconnect to their musical expressive intentions. I tell all my students that our job as musicians to emotionally engage and move our audience. If we can do that, we've succeeded. It's really the best feeling in the world to give an audience goosebumps or to make them cry, even examiners. Let's hope they're crying inside and for the right reasons. Let's maximize the next six to 10 weeks to make sure our students are fully prepared, confident, and ready to communicate something special when they walk into that performance space in October. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. And I'll hand over to Kevin for questions. All right. Are there, are no, no one's put any questions in the chat. So Marianne must have covered everything so eloquently and um, and, art, and articulated everything. Um, there's no actually written questions. So if anyone has any questions you'd like to verbalize straight away, um, yeah, just, um, just unmute yourself and um, ask away. Oh, here's a question from Coco. Hi, Marianne. Do you have any advice you would give to students undertaking group performance? Ah, yes. Thank you. Excellent question, Coco. And it's not something I've been involved with since I worked at Halebury. So hmm, let me cast my mind back. I think the balance and the blend are super important. So they need to know at every moment which is the instrument or the instruments which should be coming out of the texture more and which are more accompanying. Um, we would definitely want them to be animated with each other and um, communicating visually with each other through the pieces. Stylistic In, in stylistically appropriate ways would be clever. So um, the ways they communicate in a piece of Bach would be very different to how they might play a, as a jazz combo. Um, I'm sure other people have got excellent ideas too there too that just leap to the top of my mind. What about you, Kevin? I've never taught group performance and I haven't taught VC for a very, very long time, apart from just preparing students for, um, for exams. So um, what you're really asking them is, is to, as to perform as a group and, 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 and communicate musically. Um, yeah. And Coco, one other thing is tone color. I would really try to vary the tone color of the entire ensemble across the pieces um, so, that, so that you're maximizing the differences. Thank you, Marianne. Um, any other questions? nothing coming up well, while we're waiting for a question to come i'll just do a little bit of housekeeping um in the chat i have put a um a link and this link goes to um a very very simple evaluation form two questions couldn't be simpler <laughs> question one question two submit answer those two questions and you will automatically receive your certificate of participation now that it is um it's day of reckoning for vit now that the um the in the um invoices have um have uh have gone out um and there'll be um you need to sort of make sure that you're up to your up to your 20 um 20 hours i have found that um this year not having any of the major big multi-houred conferences um it's a little bit more difficult to gather 20 hours um, uh, of PD when you're trying to piece it together hour by hour. So um, I was very grateful for the, um, for the things that I, that I personally have been doing. So yeah, all you have to do is just click on that, click on that, that link, um, which, is goes, which goes to this, um, um, this evaluation, submit it, and then with, within seconds, you should receive um, your... Um, um, your certificate make sure that you put in the correct email address otherwise it'll just 
disappear out into nothingness. So be, be very, very careful um, about putting that in. Oh, if everyone wants to ask questions the coming day, you can get in touch with Marianne. She's given her uh, email address there, um, her education uh, email address. So if anything does come up, um, you can certainly um, pop, um, pop an email off to, to Mary Ann. Um, if there are no further questions. Oh, here we go. Earlier, you mentioned not speaking between songs for performers. Does this apply to bands too? I've heard some friendly talk between bandmates is a good thing. I, I agree. Um, it, I was speaking um, in the solo context rather than in the group context. Uh, I think that would be really appropriate. Don't let them get carried away. Um, they might like to share around introducing the pieces as well to, to the audience slash examiners. Um, I don't know about talking in performance, although in jazz that's pretty standard. So, hmm, you might... I think think ask around a bit more about that one, but I think in a band context, it would be fine. 